Hi, this is uh, a uh, screencast, a bit of an off-the-cuff one. Uh, so I've just arrived in Bloomington, Indiana to start my computer science PhD. And it's been a bit of a process getting here. I've been uh, running around for a couple of weeks, but I think I've finally settled down. As soon as I got here, I went to the International Lisp Conference to give a talk in Montreal, um, but it's been a couple of weeks since, it's been about a week since then, uh, and classes are starting on Monday, but we've already had a, uh, a couple of meetings that have been fun. I've seen uh, Oleg Kisilyov uh, give a talk. He's been visiting uh, Indiana, and uh, there's a gradual typing meeting. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to be a part of that, and that's a weekly thing. So I think I'm in the right place. So uh, for for the next uh, for recently, I've been catching up with what's uh, with a, a bunch of stuff that's been needing to be doing, needed to be done in uh, type closure, and some of them are just trivial patches and tickets. Other ones are actually quite exciting. So uh, you might not be aware, but uh, Type Closure has been uh, lucky enough to have two Google Summer of Code students working on it. One, uh, Minori uh, from uh, Japan, who uh, was working on the Closure Script checking side. This, is, uh, this has been kind of a quarter implemented for quite a while. So, um, I think he's brought it up to about three quarters and um, his work this uh, summer has been to annotate a lot of uh, CLGS.core and I think he's about 50% uh, annotated at this point and just to just to try out uh, what hasn't been correctly abstracted away um, or what isn't platform independent in type closure. And there is st still quite a lot to do. Uh, for example, calling JavaScript is not actually possible right now in uh, in type closure. But uh, uh, Minori has been working on a few things for that. Uh, so one thing he's been working on is harvesting TypeScript annotations to to use in type closure. Another thing is harvesting uh, Google Closure. Um, uh, annotations and closure script tends to use a lot of Google closure so hopefully that's quite useful right now we need to find a good representation for JavaScript objects so as far as I know the things we need for a JavaScript object in type closure we need to represent um, that it's it's mutable it uh, it can have fields it can kind of have methods which are fields at the same time and uh or or m maybe that's uh, that's wrong so it might have fields or methods uh, it definitely can have inheritance so in in typescript and other languages implemented on javascript they often have this concept of like a virtual interface where it's it doesn't really exist at runtime. It's just a set of methods that you can implement uh, that an object can implement. Uh, and TypeScript uses this, so uh, Closure Script will probably uh, typed Closure Script will probably have something similar. So that's for interfaces. Um, there's a type in Closure in typed Closure right now called JS Nominal, uh, which is basically. Uh, achieving that right now so the second google summer of code student is uh d zoo uh, or some variant of that pronunciation uh he's uh he he was actually involved in uh, type closure earlier in this year uh so he was already a contributor so uh we kind of fleshed out a, a more uh, challenging project uh, for D, and I think he did. He did really well. He's a student from China, 
and hopefully we can get both of our Google Summer of Code students from Type Closure to Closure conferences uh, soon. And uh, not entirely sure if that's happening, but uh, it would be amazing if 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 they could. And I've I've helped them create abstracts for the Closure Conj uh, on their respective Google Summer of Code projects. So D's uh, D's project was to address this uh, long-standing issue of having fairly complicated uh, variable arity functions in Clojure that are used fairly often. So think Clojure Core hash map, think Clojure Core Associ. Uh, those are two off the top of my head. But the things in common with those uh, those functions are that uh, aside from Associ that takes a, a first argument, whenever they take variable arity, uh, variable arguments, it's not simply any number of arguments. Uh, it's uh, an even number of arguments. So for a hash map, if you uh, pass one, two, three, four, uh, that's the key value, key value. So it's very, it's a very natural way of of calling the function. But if you if you give it three parameters, that is, um, it's just not correct, and it's something that type closure is built to prevent. But unfortunately. Uh, prior to D's work, there has been no way to express this. So we've been able to express um, interesting relationships between uh, parameters, like in closure core map, where the first parameter um, kind of grows at the, at the same rate as the variable amount of arguments that you pass to map. Uh, but we haven't been able to uh, constrain the number of, uh, of parameters in an abstract way. So we can't say uh, parameters must be given in a multiple of two or multiple of three. So that's the essential problem that uh, D's been, been uh, solving. I think he, he's pretty much um, found a simplified um, version of, there was one way that we could do it that was fairly general, uh, and I think D's found a uh, a more restricted way uh, to represent this that um, that that kind of works really well. So currently, I'm reviewing uh, a lot of the code, well, most of the code that D has has submitted because I basically uh, I've been traveling and and you know saying goodbye to my friends and family uh, in Australia for the last month. So I'm just kind of getting back into it right now as I, um, you know, as, as semester is starting. So, so my job right now is, is to, to review um, Dee's work. Uh, Minori's work has already been merged and that is part of core type 0.2.67. Uh, so that's awesome. If, you, if you're excited about the type closure script work, then definitely check it out, uh, expect some rough edges, expect it maybe to not work at all. But um, if you're willing to, uh, to even try it with those, uh, those constraints, uh, I'm on Twitter, there's the core type mailing list. Please let us know how you go. And uh, I don't think there's much, much left uh, to, to get it usable. So, as I'm in uh, Indiana Bloomington for a PhD, uh, there's a few things that you need to do. Uh, one of which is to publish papers. Another one is to enroll in classes. Uh, the, the easiest so far has been enrolling in classes. I'm taking uh, a couple of units. One I'm really excited about, uh, taught by Dan Friedman. And there's been a bit of history with the... With, uh, with, uh, me and and Dan's work, and I've met him at a few conferences. So it's great to uh, to basically I essentially live down the road from him now, and I've uh, yeah spent a lovely afternoon at his place, and and I've taken his uh, I think it's five twenty one uh, his unit uh, programming language principles or something some variation on that. So um, I'm excited about that. And 
uh, Sam Tobin Hutchstad has employed me as a research assistant. And so far, we've just been uh, figuring out um, what Sam needs to know about closure. Uh, so far, he's uh, he's got a closure sticker from me. So he has a JavaScript sticker, a racket sticker, and a closure sticker on the back of his laptop. So I think that's that's progress. Um, but yeah, that there's there's really only been one formal document on type closure since I began work on it, and that was uh, my undergrad dissertation. Uh, supervised by uh, Rowan Davies at the University of Western Australia. And since then, um, I've basically been working on type closure full time. So it's about a year and a half of, uh, of work. A lot of it is, is busy work, you know, just adding annotations, fixing bugs. Some other, th some other things have, have come up that are interesting, like uh, D's work, uh, with the the variable arity typing hash map and a soch and there are things that that could de definitely be published and, and fleshed out uh, with the work uh, that type closure has achieved uh, when comparing to to other gradually typed languages especially type racket because it's it's quite interesting understanding type racket and understanding why it has the features that it that it has and then looking at type closure and then saying, well, why do we need these features in type closure and why doesn't type racket have it? And the answer isn't usually, well, because the type racket people are uh, falling behind or they're, they're lazy, right? The answer is that closure is, is a different language, right? It, it needs different, uh, it has a different style, programmers use it in a different way. So, uh, my mum's talking to me. Hi, mum. So um, some of the things that I want to achieve in the next few months uh, include bridging the gap between typed racket and type closure. And the biggest difference right now is that, um, well, gradual typing is a, a very specific concept. Uh, a gradually typed language uh, or gradual typing, the concept, um, it all it means static analysis of certain portions of your code, but then also it means automatic checking of um, boundaries between languages. And if you're familiar with how type closure works, then this is quite different because you can call Java, you can call closure without having to add runtime checks. Uh, or, or even letting type closure do it automatically. I have described type closure as a linter, and that's basically what I mean. That uh, when we we don't need to add any extra uh, extra runtime behavior to typed or untyped code to accommodate type closure. So it's effectively like linting your code doesn't actually uh, need to be run. So. So one of the big things I want to do is to to add that runtime checking between typed and untyped code uh, to bring type closure to being at least potentially a, a gradually typed language. Because f from um, from the time I began type closure, I've uh, wanted it to be uh, uh, the typed portion to be sound to uh, to be able to give certain guarantees. For example. Uh, one guarantee is if your your code type checks, then you cannot uh, misuse null uh, or nil. So um, you you always know where nil is going to be allowed or disallowed, and type closure can tell you. 
uh, based on the types. So, so it's bi it's been built to uh, accommodate the runtime checking. So there are a few interesting areas actually to to accommodate it, to actually implementing this. Uh, one interesting fact is that we don't we haven't designed our own virtual machine. So typed racket has um, uh, have these contracts called chaperones and impersonators, and um, there's a, a great uh, great paper. I think it was uh, 2012 or 2013 paper uh, by some of the type racket folks uh, at Indiana and uh, Northeastern University uh, c called a uh, reasonable in uh, interposition. Uh, chaperones and impersonators and basically the the point of um, chaperones and impersonators is to help implement these higher order contracts so if you have a mutable array for example and you wanted to uh, pass it between typed and untyped code then um, it's not always clear how to wrap that array so that uh, when you pass it to untyped code from typed code uh, the invariants that you are relying on in statically typed land are going to be preserved. So chaperones and impersonators solve that problem. They, they say if you make a chaperone or impersonator out of this object then we can guarantee certain properties. So one example I like to refer to uh, that's a pr problematic in type closure is a Java arrays and there's really no way, as far as I know, to proxy a Java array, which is essentially what's happening with the chaperones and impersonators. So, for example, I might want to only write a, a, a H map of a certain type, a heterogeneous map, which is a type closure's way of representing uh, keyword maps in closure, which is a very common idiom in, in, in closure programming. So say I only wanted to write a, a H map of, of with two entries A and B, both ints. So there is no way to, uh, to hack the, the Java runtime or the JVM to allow that. So we're not going to be able to, to, to fully support the things that I might want to, right? So we can't change J the JVM. Uh, on the other hand, Type Racket had the luxury of being uh, very tightly interwoven with Racket in in some areas, at least. In that, the, the, m many of the same developers work on on uh, Racket and Type Racket. So, uh, uh, Type Racket drives a lot of the contracts work. Not all of it, but it's definitely the, uh, in at least in my opinion, and I think. Uh, uh, Robbie Findler uh, wrote this in his ICFP keynote notes, uh, in uh, which that um, gradual typing is the uh, the most, I guess, most popular or most uh, most interesting application of contracts. So type racket is kind of driving a lot of the uh, a lot of the problem solving in racket contracts. And uh, there's impersonators and, and uh, chaperones are, are one uh, output of that of that work. So the racket runtime was uh, was actually uh, made aware of chaperones and impersonators at the very bottom. So the C code that implements the racket virtual machine knows what a chaperone is and knows how to preserve uh, instance checks and object identity. Uh, which are actually big problems in um, in these kinds of contracts. Uh, Jeremy Seek and a couple of uh, uh, I'm I'm sorry I, f I forgot who published this, but uh, uh, there's a com there's a conference uh, DLS is it Dynamic Languages Symposium. I'm I'm probably making that up, but there's a uh, gradually typed or an optional type system. No, no, it's actually a um, it's a survey of using contracts in Python, and I'll uh, I guess I'll put a link to it in this video. And uh, Jeremy and uh, and his students are basically looking at uh, I think it's 
three or four different ways of applying contracts in Python. One big problem is that uh, if you wrap contracts around a particular value, you violate object identity. So uh, for example, in Clojure, we, we use object identity to uh, compare keywords, for example. So the keyword A and the keyword A are, 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 are the same object. So you can call identical question mark on them and it'll return true. So for example, if for some reason we wanted to wrap that keyword to add some check for some reason, uh, that, that equality check would break. And it turns out this is a big issue in Python. So that uh, Python have ha has had to, uh, so, so this paper is describing the pros and cons of the different approaches. And I think I'm gonna have to take some of the lessons learned there because uh, these, uh, the, the way I uh, implement contracts are invariably probably going to break object identity. And the only reason it hasn't in type racket is because they've changed the underlying VM to understand chaperones and impersonators. But it might not actually be such a problem in Clojure. I've got to actually uh, do a survey of common Clojure code and, and see what kind of idioms and, uh, and, and common style are, are broken by, uh, by throwing out object identity checks. Uh, so yeah, that's that's one area. So the uh, how to implement chaperones and impersonators, which are essentially uh, how to wrap mutable things uh, to go between typed and untyped code. much in the same area. Another interesting uh, problem I've identified is how we uh, interact, uh, how we use multi-methods in typed and untyped code. So I think this is actually a bit more achievable and I have some ideas as to how this could work. But if you're familiar with closure uh, multi-methods, you'll know that there are a few things you can do with it. You can define a multi-method, you can Add a uh, add a new method to a multi method, and you can call a multi method, and um, I th that's uh, that's pretty much it. So you can imagine um, if you chose one of those three things and said, "What if I did this in typed land and did the other thing in untyped land?" For example, what if I defined the multi method in typed land and then extended it in untyped land? So I added a method. So what kind of runtime checks do I need to add um, to, to preserve the, uh, the guarantees uh, that type closure expects? And um, following from that is generalizing that problem to just vars in general, um, where we have this issue where we define a typed var, but of course vars are global um, in, in closure. There's no, there's no concept of importing and exporting and, and private vars um, other than very superficial um, concepts like that. So in typed racket, you're able to um, export a contracted version or import an uncontracted version or uh, variants of, of, of in that uh, kind of area it, using that, uh, those ideas. But you can't do that with closure because we just use, um, we just refer refer vars into our namespace quite liberally, and uh, there's no way to kind of say, I want to import this var in this namespace, but only in this namespace when I refer to it, it should be wrapped in this contract. So there's no way to do that. And um, one idea I've had to fixing that or to supporting that is to basically. Um, well, the, the first issue is I want to transform typed code and that's something that's not happening right now uh, because you can run type closure, the type checker at any point. So it's like a linter, which is what I've liked to say uh, 
up till now. Uh, but the next step is to make it not like a linter in that um, if you want, you can say, okay, type closure can um, process my entire source code, transform it, and then evaluate it for you. So for example, if we wanted every var reference in a, in a closure file to, to mean something else, type closure could expand it out using tools.analyzer, which is the, the great work by uh, Nicola Mometto or Bronzer on the, uh, on the mailing list and IRC and um, use the AST from uh, Tools Analyzer and uh, walk it and find every var reference and replace it with something. So in this case, I would like to replace this var reference with perhaps another var reference. So one idea I had was for every def in a typed, in a typed namespace, I, I transform the def to actually uh, define two vars. One var is the typed var and that is uncontracted. So that's intended to be used inside the typed code. And the other, uh, I won't pull the middle finger to you, but the other, um, uh, the other var that we're going to define is the, the quote exported var um, that we like uh, that we'd like untyped code to use. So the trick here is we've got two vars. What do we call them, right? And how do we refer to them uh, without going crazy? So my first idea, well, the, the idea that I have right now, the uncontracted var, which is intended to be used in the typed namespace or in typed land, is, uh, is a gensim var, which is, uh, you know, obfuscated in some way. And then once we uh, go over the AST and transform it, every var reference in the, um, in the typed land is replaced with the obfuscated version. So essentially, effectively, it means that typed code is using only the uncontracted versions of typed code of typed vars rather. So we don't have the liberty of transforming untyped code that we don't control. So um, the, the other kind of var that we defined with the def is the contracted version. So that's intended for the untyped land to use, pardon me. And that would be the same name. So if you said def ABC, uh, you'd have ABC underscore one, two, three would be the uncontracted version and ABC would be the contracted version. So untyped, co uh, untyped code can use the, un uh, can use the contracted version as usual. So you just require the type known space, refer to it, and then you, you have, uh, you know, the, the, the invariance at runtime automatically wrapped. So yeah, the, the first thing, the first problem uh, with what I've just described is we don't have a way of transforming code. And the other one is that we don't have a very sophisticated way of wrapping, uh, of, of contracting closure code at runtime. So we have kind of first order and, and higher order uh, contracts, but um, contracts kind of go, have been pushed quite far and there are contracts that uh, resemble dependent typing and have sophisticated ways of uh, allocating blame uh, uh, to uh, to help the programmer track exactly where, where an error was introduced. And um, those chaperones and impersonators I was talking about uh, with the contracts before that those, that's another area that uh, closure uh, libraries could really uh, could could steal. So there's lots of good ideas to steal in uh, in uh, in the area of contracts. And uh, much like type racket, I suspect type closure might be a driving force uh, for uh, for some of this work. At least that's where I'm going to um, be be coming from. So. Um, those are the things that, that I've been working on so far. Um, 
next week, uh, the gradually typed, weekly gradually typed meeting is on again, and I'm giving a, uh, I was nominated kindly by Sam to give a talk on uh, a, a cool paper that I, f- that I found uh, called uh, Typed Lua. I think it's a, an optional type system for Lua, Typed Lua. And uh, I, I picked it up and I read the title and it, it read almost exactly like my, uh, my undergraduate d- dissertation. So naturally, I just kind of read it straight through and thoroughly enjoyed it. And I found I, I agreed with uh, almost everything in the, uh, in the paper. Um, I still need to read it a couple more times to, to, to get the gist of it. Um, but yeah, um, I'll probably give a practice run of that uh, uh, as a video. That there are, I, could, I could probably go on for another uh, 15 minutes or 20 uh, just on the, the little that I've read. Uh, but I did get in contact with Andre, the, uh, the, the guy, uh, he's just finishing his PhD on Type Lua now, and I was uh, very happy to hear that uh, my Google Summer of Code project for Type Closure had some influence on him uh, getting started with Type Lua. And uh, so yeah, it's, it's great that, that uh, Type Closure is, you know, uh, having its own influence on, on languages. Uh, that's, that's very gratifying. So, uh, thanks for listening. This was a, um, a bit of an experiment. And, uh, yeah, hopefully next week you get to hear about the, uh, how type lure is like, uh, uh, type closure and how it isn't and, uh, and the things that type lure wants to do in the future. Cool. Uh, thanks for listening and have a good one. Bye. Thank you.